All right, so we just had what was it was a fairly broad but uh, drilled down a, uh, a discussion of skills, and and uh, and I want to pivot right off it uh, when when starting with the three of you. The municipal level is the place where we really see the forces of education and and social uh, social work come to and and government actual pilot type programs come together for solving problems of youth unemployment. Could you each sort of tell me what you have been working on and how it has worked in your cities? Well, you know, starting off, um, being the mayor of any city is where the rubber meets the road. We don't, we don't have anybody else to blame about anything. We can't pass it on. It, it all rests at the mayor's office. And what we try to do is to uh, create opportunities, especially for young people in the community. Uh, for example, we have a uh, kids and jobs program where teenagers uh, or, or hired by corporations and companies to teach them the work ethic. And that's very important at an early age to get kids involved. Uh, Mayor Nutter and I, we're part of the uh, My Brother's Keepers uh, initiative, and, and that's trying to build collaboration with the private sector, the public sector, uh, the nonprofit sector to create ladders of opportunity for young people in our community. And, and those are the type of things that we're working on. Yeah. Yeah. Many of the same things in Philadelphia. Two days ago, we just had a big press conference with the corporate community, the philanthropic community, uh, many of our stakeholder partners uh, in uh, creating uh, more summer job opportunities for young people. And really, we need to start thinking about uh, year-round uh, summer, uh, year-round employment uh, for young people as well. These moments, this opportunity summit, uh, when people talk about an opportunity moment, uh, is very, very real. And so, if everyone did their part. If Every company in Philadelphia, every company in Birmingham, every company in Ithaca took on a young person, and some obviously can do much more. We'd have thousands, tens of thousands of summer job opportunities and then year-round opportunities. Uh, and so through our Work Ready program, partnered with uh, Philadelphia Youth Network, and a bunch of our folks are here, uh, Jakima uh, and uh, Stephanie, uh, this is... Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> she came with Fulmore Townsend and Stephanie Gambone, uh, great, great folks. Uh, we created a program uh, in partnership with AmeriCorps, uh, PowerCorps, PHL, a bunch of our young people here for that, giving them uh, that much more uh, opportunity. So it really is about opportunity. It's about focus. The government can do a bunch of things, but we really need partners uh, in this work. For $1,700 in the course of a summer, you could change someone's life and put them on a trajectory to success. And that's really... Uh, what this work is all about. That's great. Well, we also have a youth employment uh, service program where we take teens, we pay them to work just about anywhere. And uh, we found that to be successful, but what we have actually started to do, uh, for young people particularly, particularly people who are not succeeding in school, they need to see a clear bright line between that employment training program and a job at the end of the tunnel. If they don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, they're not going to sign up, they're not going to stay engaged, and they're not going to succeed. So we've started actually targeting, uh, doing sort of real-time, on-time uh, employment training programs. So when we know, as we know now, that we have a boom in hotels, right? we've got three hotels under construction in downtown Ithaca right now. That means uh, uh, hundreds of living wage jobs that will be coming online in the next two years. We started last year. Uh, an employment training program specifically for hospitality. And we asked Cornell University to help us develop a program. It was an eight-week paid, it's got to be paid, training where you come out certified and we could point to the actual construction. I mean, we could say that building that you see being erected is going to need 40 people to work in it. And we're going to give you a certificate that will prepare you on day one to walk in and ask for a job. Job training programs like that with a clear, bright line uh, uh, to a light at the end of the tunnel, we found to be far more successful. For all of you, uh, you, you live in cities where a phenomenon that we're seeing across America is playing out, which is researchers have found how easy it is for a given student or a given young person to move up economically is very correlated with their zip code, even, mm -hmm. where, 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 where it is that they grow up, not just the city, but where it is. So how do you help increase, this is a bigger problem than just summer job programs, how do you help break down those barriers to advancement from birth all the way until they're entering the workforce? Well, well I'll, I'll say this, this is very personal to me because 
um, statistically, I'm an anomaly. I was born in 1987. And Wait, everybody wrap their heads around that, by the way. <laughs> I wasn't even... Okay. This is, I think this is my first time ever on a panel with someone younger than me. That, <laughs> right. that wasn't even the punchline. Uh, I was, no, I was born in 87 uh, in the inner city. My father was addicted to drugs. <laughs> and I'm... <laughs> Uh, my father Thanks. was <laughs> uh, a drug addict, single mother, and I spent the first six months of my life in a homeless shelter. And for the first eight years, we were insecure. We bounced around a lot. And my story is uh, the exception, and it doesn't need to be, because my story would never have needed... So, there's a lot of time spent studying the poor and these poor zip codes and saying, what can we do in the poor zip codes? The truth is, we need to study the wealthy neighborhoods because what the wealthy folks are doing is working, right? <laughs> People who grow up... So the reason that uh, I was born in homelessness is that when my mother was seven months pregnant, she was a grill cook. Uh, I was too close to the oven, so she couldn't cook anymore. And she didn't have paid family leave, right? So for the last two months of her pregnancy, she went without a paycheck, when we came home from the hospital, there was a red eviction notice on her door. And drugs tore my family apart. They damaged my father irreparably. But what drugs didn't damage, the war on drugs did. Jail time, taking him out of our home, creating large gaps in his resume that made it impossible for him to work or to get into treatment. Right? And the fact that my mother, thankfully, is a superhero and could work three minimum wage jobs so that we could have a quality of life that allowed all of us to go to college. All of us are now successful, contribute. You know, my brother's a high paid executive at, at American Express. My sister is doing well at at and I mean, it, we have become successful because she could work those three well-paying jobs. But if the minimum wage was a living wage, and you didn't need food stamps, you didn't need to work 80 hours a week just to support your family. If we had paid sick leave, if we ended the war on drugs, and if we raised the minimum wage to a living wage, then we would not have to rescue teenagers. We would not have six million young people unemployed. We would have young people that by the time they were teenagers had steady, stable households and were prepared to exceed. And we know that it works because it works in wealthy neighborhoods. And, and, and let me add, the, the, the other issue is to, you know, how do you eliminate that barrier by zip code, you have to uh, create a comprehensive plan to improve the quality of life across the board in your community. In Birmingham, we created a plan called, called RISE. And what RISE does, it, it gives us the opportunity to go into neighborhoods and, and remove blight, uh, increase value, strengthen our neighborhoods, and engage the citizenry. And, and kids and jobs have to be one component of that. When you build a sense of pride in your neighborhood, when you uh, uh, get the support of individuals who can be role models for those kids, it helps in improve the image that that neighborhood has. It, it, it improves the cooperation in that neighborhood. And then you begin to strengthen the neighborhood to the point that it doesn't matter whether or not your zip code is in a certain area. You know there are opportunities there. You try to build upon those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I would add, it's, it's also about exposure. Uh, to the possibilities of something different uh, in your life. Um, I would venture to say that most successful people uh, were probably not wondering if they were going to get out of their teens or into their 20s. They could see, as the mayor was talking about, they could see a path uh, to a future. And so, you know, if you stay out in harsh elements too long, of course, you will die from exposure. Mm -hmm. In many of our neighborhoods, our young people die from a lack of exposure uh, to what the world is beyond the three blocks around their house. They walk past, ride past on a bus, go past in a car, uh, colleges and universities virtually each and every day. But so many young people in Philadelphia and other places have never actually stepped onto a college campus or have any idea what's going on there. And so, again, at least in the summertime, opportunity for exposure to college and university, to take classes on that campus, the potential of living uh, in some of those dorms as the young people who are in school go back uh, home or, you know, or kind of away uh, from school for the summer. And so it's really about giving folks a, a sense of what their future can be, that there is, again, whether it's a parent, a, a aunt, uncle, lady down the street or whomever, a caring, nurturing adult who is going to take the time to talk with them 
nurture them, support them, encourage them in a variety of things, and really just, you know, what do you want to do? What's your, you know, last week I gave a big speech about uh, youth violence prevention. I talked about having individual success plans, an ISP. Who's helping you? with your ISP. What do you want to do? What is your goal? Now, you might want to be a professional football player. That's very interesting. But you might want to have a plan B because, you know, they're like 32 teams, 53 players. You do the math. Uh, there's less than 2,000 people in a 300 plus million uh, person country who do that. So you might want to have a backup plan. Um, and so how do you help young people craft that future? What courses should you be taking in high school for whatever it is that you want to do, knowing that uh, that might change uh, as uh, you progress in high school or college. I wanted to be a doctor. You know, chemistry three changed my life, so you know I needed to do something different uh, and, and, and figure out a, a, a different path. And so, I mean, it, again, what are adults doing on behalf of young people? All of us struggle with, you know, cuts and grants and programs. Uh, unfortunately, again, from you know the folks here in Washington D.C. having no idea these folks who make these decisions have no real idea the impact that those decisions have on real people back home. As Mayor Bell said, we can't push stuff away. We don't do continuing resolutions. Our budgets are actually balanced every year. You know, if we ever thought about saying to our citizens, well, you know, we're going um, to fund our government for the next three months and then we'll see what happens. People will go berserk. I mean, they would never stand for that kind of nonsense. So, I mean, these are serious jobs and real issues that we're trying to deal with. And a greater partnership, certainly with the federal government and the Congress, they could get out of their own way and just actually do some things on behalf of the American public, especially young, young people. Uh, you'd be amazed at what we could accomplish. Well, I do want to bring up a serious issue. It's like being at Phillies game at Nats Park. Uh, <laughs> I want to bring up a serious issue that uh, Mayor Meyer brought up, which is criminal justice reform. Yeah. And this is uh, something that Washington actually is talking about in a new and interesting way in the last year in particular. Uh, the ideas of, 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 do we need to rethink drug sentencing laws in the way, and we sure. know the impacts that those laws can have on, on young people and their future employment opportunities. Right. I'm interested in what Mayor Bell, what Mayor uh, Nutter, what you think of of this. You know, we have a program called the Dannon program that, that help uh, individuals who have been incarcerated get back into the workforce, uh, rebuild their lives. Uh, that's one component. But you also have to work on not allowing our kids to get involved in the industrial uh, incarceration um, um, industry from the start. And, and that's why it's so important to create mentoring programs so that someone can grab that kid by the hand and say, let me show you a better way of life. But then you have to have the programs in place to make sure that you continue to push them in the right direction. And the Danner Project is one of the ways that we do that. Uh, it's funded by the uh, Labor Department. Uh, we, we put local funds in there, but we also have private sector funds. And that's a collaboration that we talk about on, on bringing all the resources together to deal with a, a specific problem, but it's part of a greater uh, uh, program that you have to improve the quality of life in your cities. Last year, President Obama in the State of the Union address, um, and he uh, repeated it at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, or I'm sorry, at the, uh, uh, at the, uh, at the DNC uh, meeting just last week, the President said uh, that it was time to give America a raise. Hmm. When I heard that, we'll never forget, I was listening to the State of the Union very attentively between the tweets and all that, and the President's kicking it out and he's doing his thing, but I had to stop said he's right. Immediately called, sent a note to my folks and said, we need to figure out how to get people who do business with the city of Philadelphia to immediately raise the wages of those who work for us through those contractors. Subsequently signed an executive order. The president talked about 1010. We did 1088 immediately uh, last year. Uh, and then uh, through that legislation, subsequent legislation, it went to $12 an hour, January 1st, 2015, with a CBI, CPI attached to it, so that every January 1st, there will be an increase for those who do contract work in the city of Philadelphia. That's going to help lift some folks out of poverty. The second thing is, last year, a uh, great controversy in Philadelphia, and I don't necessarily want to get into the more recent controversy here in D.C., around the issue of marijuana. So we decriminalized, did not legalize, we decriminalized uh, marijuana 
uh, given uh, the uh, number of young people who are not dealers, not distributors, they're kind of doing whatever they're doing, sometimes just really uh, being knuckleheads and getting in trouble, but they end up with a criminal record. And so again, when Mayor Myrick talks about the um, barriers in the war on drugs, because we're so tough on those issues, if you have a criminal conviction for drugs, you are virtually prohibited from getting financial aid to go to school. But if you have a murder conviction, you are not prohibited from getting financial aid to go to school. That is one of the dumbest things the federal government has ever done. There's a fairly decent list on the list of dumb things. But, um, and then just, uh, just about 10 days or so ago, uh, coincidentally on the same day that the Congress introduced uh, paid sick leave, uh, working with our city council, I had the honor of signing a paid sick leave bill uh, for the city of Philadelphia. We work uh, with our uh, formerly incarcerated, what I call returning citizens. I signed an executive order prohibiting uh, the official, the use of the term ex-offender in any communication uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and aside from law enforcement or public safety, about 10% of the folks who have gotten jobs with the city of Philadelphia during my tenure as mayor have a previous criminal record. If you want the city to be safe, if you want people to get back into civil society, give that person a second or possibly a third chance to turn their life around. Uh, and so, you know, these are the kinds of things that we can do. And there are employers out there who will hire someone with a previous criminal record. And I've had those employers tell me that some of those folks are some of the best employees they've ever hired. That person knows they're getting a second chance. They know they can't mess up. They come on time. They do their job. They're staying out of trouble, taking care of themselves and their families. And so, you know, you're either going to help that person get a job or you're going to meet them in an alley somewhere. I'd rather have the former than the latter. And so they're not going anywhere. They're not moving. They're not leaving. Uh, often are stuck uh, in their situations. We need to lift these folks up and give them uh, that opportunity that they need. Yeah, yeah please. <clears throat> that, that is so well said because, again, we know if, if you think that somebody who uses drugs at 16 or 18 or 22 is devoid of potential, uh, then we would not have had the last three presidents that we had. Right? I mean, we know what works to get people, I'm not saying that drugs are good, of course drugs are bad. But again, if you look at what happens in, in wealthy neighborhoods or suburban neighborhoods, when John gets caught with weed at 16, right, his parents will intervene, maybe they'll send him to counseling, maybe they'll even send him to rehab. They'll work to address the underlying issue, whether it's loneliness or boredom or anxiety, they will get him health care that he needs so that he does not have to self-medicate with these drugs. But when John in the inner city gets caught, he gets caught by the police, and he's more likely to get arrested. We need to end the drug war because we do not send drug users to prison. We send poor people who use drugs to prison. Yeah. And until we stop that, we will be losing and wasting so much human potential. We will be writing off entire people's lives by the time they are 16 years old. And those are people that can become the next CEOs, athletes, surgeons, doctors, and even, even possibly elected officials. <laughs> and, 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 let, let me just they say can, one, one other thing. In, in, a, in a previous life, I was a probation officer. And in one evening, uh, we had six kids arrested. Three were African-American. They were brought in and charged with grand theft of auto. We had three other kids who were, who were uh, Caucasian they were arrested and brought in for joyriding. Now, both groups was riding in someone else's car without permission. <laughs> now, those kids who were charged with grand larceny, that's a felony. Okay, the kids who were charged with uh, 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 joyriding, that's a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. So look at the records. They're stigmatized from the very beginning. We've got to end that type of thing, even in school. Even in school. You know, there were things that we all would do in school, and you get sent to the principal office. Nowadays, you get sent to juvenile detention. We've got to end that. We, yeah. we, we've got to treat kids like kids, work with them, give them the opportunity, and build those safety nets so that they can become decent, uh, uh, worthwhile citizens in our community. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Well, this is a great note to end on. I want to thank all of you. And again, I want to thank you all for your attention. This has been a fabulous panel, and I just really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Katie Wolfgang. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Good job. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you.